Right, okay, so thanks for joining me. So as it says here, I'm gonna talk about how to deal with design debt. So my name's Neil Turner, I'm a product designer in the UK working at Redgate Software. So before I do so, I'm gonna start with a short story. So our story begins in the American frontier of the late 19th century, so more commonly referred to as the Wild West. And as the name suggests, the Wild West was indeed a very wild place, you know, the sort of place where it paid to have a good gun you know, a gun very much like this. So this is the Winchester level action repeating rifle. Uh, and it's often referred to as the gun that won the West because over 7,000 of these uh, were sold. And this made this gentleman um, <coughs> who founded the Winchester Repeating Arms Company a very, very wealthy man. So this is Oliver Winchester. And Oliver died in 1880. Um, passing ownership of the company to his son, William Winchester. Now, unfortunately, William died from tuberculosis the next year, meaning that the vast family wealth passed over to this lady. So this lady is Sarah Winchester, wife of William. And this made Sarah a very, very wealthy lady with a fortune worth about half a billion dollars today. Now, of course, an incredible, we incredibly wealthy lady uh, needs a very grand house. So in 1884, Sarah started construction of Winchester House in San Jose, California. And as we can see here, Winchester House was a magnificent Queen Anne style Victorian mansion. And it had some of the latest technology of the day. It had push button gas lights, it had hot showers, it had three elevators. Now, unfortunately, Sarah had a rather unusual approach to building Winchester House. So popular legend holds that she was convinced that because of the great number of people who'd been shot and killed by the Winchester rifle, she was cursed by the Winchester fortune. And the only way to alleviate this curse was to continually add to her California home. And if construction stopped, the curse would claim poor Sarah. And this explains why the house was continually built and remodeled from 1884 until Sarah's death in 1922. So a period of 38 years. And it's fair to say that Sarah had a rather haphazard approach to building her home. So she didn't have a master plan and nor did she ever employ an architect. And so this is what the house looks like today. And if you remember the photo from before, at one point it had 160 rooms, but unfortunately an earthquake in 1906 destroyed three stories of the house. But you know, on the outside, it's still a pretty grand house, you know, with very, uh, a grand setting. So whilst on the outside it looks you know, relatively ordinary, albeit on a grand scale, if you go inside you'll find some very, very strange design features. So there are staircases that lead nowhere. There are windows that face onto walls. There are doors that can't be opened and there are even doors that open onto walls. So one visitor described it as a house where downstairs leads neither to the cellars nor upstairs to the roof. So it was a house that through years of haphazard construction and remodeling is almost purposely designed to disorientate and to confuse its users. So Winchester House is certainly unusual for a house, but it's not that unusual for a software. So if we look at Winchester House, so we've got ongoing build, not really a master plan and constant remodeling. So it's pretty unusual for a house to have this, but for agile software, pretty usual. Ongoing build, no master plan, constant remodeling. But wait, I hear you say, if we're taking an agile iterative approach, we should end up with a Mona Lisa, right? You know, okay, we'll, we'll start with a sketchy MVP version one that needs a bit more work, but after a few iterations, we'll get there. But the reality is invariably very different. So just like the Winchester House, our agile approach leads to lots of design debt building up. And instead of ending up with a bonkers house, we end up with something more like this. And rather than starting out with a skateboard and nicely progressing to a car, we end up with something like this, a Frankenstein design that's been very crudely put together. Now I'm gonna outline what design debt is and then talk about how to stop it building up too much. And, <clears throat> how to deal with any debt that has built up over time. But first, what is design debt? So I'm sure you've all heard about technical debt. And if technical debt is the 
unseen cost of MVPs, early iterations, suboptimal solutions and quick fixes, then design debt is the very visible cost of taking an agile, fast-paced approach. So if software debt were a huge, hulking iceberg waiting to sink a product, technical debt would be the ice lurking below the surface, and design debt would be at the top of the iceberg, poking out of the water for everyone to see. So design debt are the UI components and design patterns that differ from page to page. They're the design debt's the sprawling navigation that builds up and up like a giant Jenga stack. You know, very much like if you see here, the, the menu items now you find on Facebook. Design debt is the unaddressed usability issues, such as the little end meeting link on Zoom. It was always so hard to find. Oh, look, there it is. Now, fortunately, that's now a button, but again, it's a good example of, uh, of a usability uh, issue as part of design debt. Design debt's the settings page that takes a full 20 seconds to scroll through. Okay, believe me, there's 20 more seconds, but it's, yeah, there's a lot there. Turns out the Zoom has a lot of design debt. So design debt, it's the primary button that's styled differently on different screens. It's the unaddressed usability issue that should have been fixed long ago. It's the feature that uses a different design pattern for no good reason. It's the menu with a never ending list of seemingly randomly placed options. It's the terminology that differs from screen to screen. And it's the feature that was released but never iterated. And, <clears throat> and just like monetary debt, unless you deal with design debt, it's gonna build up and up and up and eventually cause a, a major headache. So how do, you, how do you deal with design debt? How do you stop it, how do you stop too much of it building up in the first place? So I'm going to run through eight tactics for dealing with design debt. And the first of these is to have a strategy. Because while I'm sure you're familiar with this all too true quote from Benjamin Franklin, one of America's founding fathers, in this world, nothing is certain but death and taxes. So I think if, if Benjamin was around today, he'd know to update his famous quote. Because in this new agile world, nothing is certain but death, taxes, and debt. Because whether you like it or not, debt is going to build up, you know, in a, in a world of MVPs, experiments, sprints, and agile product development. It, it's pretty inevitable. So you need to be proactive when it comes to debt, not just reactive. You know, you can't just brush it under the carpet or assume that someone else is going to pick it up or it's not going to happen with, with your team and your product. You need a strategy for dealing with design debt. And I think the first part of that strategy is to create and validate high level designs. So what do I mean by that? So if you remember Sarah Winchester and her slightly bonkers house, she didn't have a master plan, meaning that she ended up with a house that made no sense. She simply added new bits without really thinking about, thinking about how the house as a whole worked together. But whether you're building a house or a product, you really should have a master plan, you know, a high level idea of what your product will do and how users will get value from using it. And you don't need to know all the details, but certainly you should know the type of product you're building, you know, maybe some of the features you'll need and the sort of user experience required to deliver real value for your customers. So going back to house building, you, you don't need to plan out exactly how every room will look prior to building the house, but you should probably know how many rooms are going to be built and what sort of rooms they'll be. And a great way to do this for a uh, digital product is to create a story map. Uh, so a story map like the one shown here shows the, the user stories that are necessary to allow a user to carry out some of the tasks that they, that they need to be able to do. So it doesn't include all the design details, but enough to start to plan out the product design and to reduce some of that ongoing redesign work uh, that, that might otherwise happen. So with a story map, so you start by defining the key user goal or job to be done. So for something like PowerPoint, it might be, for example, create a presentation. And then you define the tasks that users need to be able to do to achieve that. So that might be things like creating a slide deck, importing images, being able to present the slides. And then for each of those tasks, you define the steps necessary to do that. And then you can start to define um, some of the release slices. 
So how are you going to deliver those steps? You know, what's an initial MVP, for example, type release going to look like? So if you want to find out more about user story mapping, I can certainly recommend uh, Jeff Patton's excellent user story mapping book. And um, another way to get, um, think about high level design and start to validate it is using things like storyboards. So this, for example, is a storyboard um, from one of the teams at Redgate to help um, communicate a concept and get feedback around that concept. And also using things like low fidelity prototypes can really help to get feedback and to reduce the amount of debt being introduced because you can start to validate um, designs early on. So for example, this is a team at Redgate reviewing some early designs with a customer and teams will regularly run user feedback sessions before a feature or a design change is released. And this helps to minimize the amount of design debt being introduced in the first place. So number three is user design system. So hopefully you've already got a design system in place. And whilst it's tempting to plow ahead without a design system in place, this invariably leads to lots of design and technical debt building up. Because trying to retrospectively apply or even build a design system once a product is out there is very much like trying to herd cats. You know, once a product is out and into the wild, it's much, much harder to change um, than whilst it's being developed. And having the design system in place makes it easier to ensure that the same design patterns and UI components are used across a product and to generally keep everything in sync. So for example, this is Honeycomb, uh, Redgate's design system. And as part of that, we're in the process of updating our design system. So building out um, libraries and Figma. So a design tool that we use for UI, creating shared UI components and also for creating a React library of components that can be used across products. And it's important not just to include the components of your design system, but also to provide guidance for their use. You know, and I think something like um, the gov.uk design system does a really good job of this. Because otherwise you can have the same design components, but used differently and inconsistently. So for example, things like checkboxes and switches, where they might be used in slightly different ways. So um, next tactic is to level up the team. So what do I mean by level up the team? Well, because you know, the more a team knows about design, the less design debt a team will unwittingly release. So collectively practicing design, learning more about design, it's a great way to increase the design know-how within a team. So for example, this is a workshop with a product team at Redgate to create and review designs for a new feature. And um, not just running things like workshops, but we're also running training courses with teams at Redgate covering topics such as usability, UI design and usability testing. And this all helps to level up the product teams. And also as part of that, um, there's a monthly newsletter that, that goes out to share useful design resources, articles, videos and books. So it's all about um, collectively leveling up because the more a team knows about design and good design, the less design debt a team will unwittingly um, release. Tactic. Tactic number five is catch design debt at reviews. So um, in the same way that code should always be reviewed prior to release, designs should also always be reviewed prior to release. And this is a really great way to catch unwanted design debt from sneaking through. So for example, that might be things like uh, different terminology being used. Um, inconsistent UI components or even obvious usability issues that really should be addressed. And you know, after all, it's much easier to change code before it's been released into the wild. And any design issues that are caught prior to release, you know, they won't be seen by users. And um, not only in terms of having a, uh, a review as part of the process within a team, but also can be good to think about, well, how can you bake that in? So for example, um, maybe including a review step as part of your workflow board, you know, whether you use something like uh, Jira to manage your, or GitHub to manage your, your development work. And if you use something like GitHub, you can add a, a prompt, so for example, for a design review to your PR template. So just to prompt people to think about, well, actually, you know, does this need to be reviewed? Is this, is this, um, is this change that's being made? 
you know, do I need to have someone to have a look at it to see, you know, is it consistent? Is it using the right sort of terminology? Right, tactic number six, so keep a record of design debt. So some of you might remember the uh, film from 2000, so over 20, 20 years old now, by Christopher Nolan called Memento. Um, and in this film, Guy Pearce, um, shown here, he, he, he plays a man who suffers from amnesia. Uh, so he's an investigator, meaning he can no longer form new memories. And he's trying to piece together who killed his wife. Um, and he uses tattoos and notes to himself to try and keep track of this investigation because he, he, can't, he can't retain those memories himself, or at least not, um, uh, not at that point of the film. You know, and and it's, a, it's a great film if you've not seen it. And um, I often kind of think of the film and I think almost of, kind of, of, of Guy Pearce um, when I see design debt and how design debt is handled in teams. Because you know, sometimes it can feel design debt, it can, it can feel a little bit like this. You know, a team will um, uncover something or, or you know, someone will notice something, but then it gets forgotten about. You know, it's not, it's not um, you know, that, that, there's no record of that. You know, and a bit like, um, a bit like, you know, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't think I'd suggest uh, tattooing yourself like Guy, Guy Pierce here, but certainly having uh, some ongoing log and record of design debt is a good way to ensure that, um, you know, that is retained and that you can start to uh, address that or at least have a log of what, does it, what debt uh, exists within the product. So for example, this is a confluence page um, that one of the teams at Redgate has put together detailing potential usability issues for a product at Redgate. And this page is used to uh, keep track of the design debt um, that, that comes up and not just keep track of it, but also some ideas for addressing it and start to think like kind of prioritize it. You know, is this, is this high priority? Is it, you know, how important is this to, um, to, to the users? How, you know, how important is it to the team? And also there's a dedicated uh, GitHub board. So Kanban type GitHub board for dealing with technical and design debt. And so product teams will pick up items from this board as part of their ongoing sprint work. So there's a, there's a record of the debt which feeds into the ongoing development work. And I'll talk a little bit, I'll talk in a, in a little bit about um, how teams can, can manage that workload and, and kind of plan to execute uh, and start to address some of those issues. So uh, next tactic, focus on key user tasks. So it's often tempting when talking about uh, design debt or technical debt, I guess, to start to fix some of the easiest issues, you know, the low hanging fruit, so to speak. But really, rather than uh, going for the low hanging fruit, you should be starting with the most damaging debt. And a great way to identify um, potentially harmful design debt within your product is to um, look at some of the key user journeys and start to maybe do a, a, a walkthrough, some user testing of those key journeys, or like a, a, you know, a UX review. And look at, well, you know, we know that this is a really key journey in the product, so what are, what's, what's some of the design dead issues in there that we might need to address? You know, maybe that's things like usability issues, inconsistencies, um, you know, uh, components that are that are different across that journey. So you can see here a, a workshop that was run with one of the teams at, at Redgate. So with lots of post-it notes, kind of capturing um, the outputs um, of that kind of a workshop. Uh, obviously, this was a, a physical workshop. You can do this um, online now using something like um, Mural, for example. You know, so you can have a, a, a collective workshop and start to capture things. And um, once you've captured um, a lot of those, you know, the, 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 the issues and, the, um, and, the, and the, the kind of debt to be addressed, I guess, um, really there's kind of three main buckets where you want to think about in terms of prioritizing, in terms of, in terms of kind of action here. So firstly, there are things that really must be addressed now. So these are, these are some of those kind of showstoppers some of the things where it's like, it's very glaring, maybe a glaring usability issue or a glaring inconsistency or, 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 or some other 
glaring piece of debt within the, within the product. Um, secondly, there are things that should be addressed soon. So this is things that, um, okay, so they're not showstoppers, but really you should be dealing with them pretty soon. You know, maybe again, it's a, a usability issue where actually, yeah, we think that's, that's, that's going to cut out a lot of our users. And then finally, there's things that the team can, um, can live with for now. You know, these are lower priority. So these are things, well, you know, um, we can probably live with this, but we really should be addressing this sometime in the future. And as I say, I'll talk a little bit about how you can go about um, factoring in and addressing some of that as part of ongoing work. Which brings me on to uh, my last tactic, which is to factor tackling debt into your planning. Because um, all too often design debt, it kind of fall, falls to the bottom of the to-do list. You know, a bit like um, technical debt. You know, design debt related work can often languish at the bottom of a product backlog. You know, there are always cool new features to be worked on. Well, there's always stuff, well, you know, the, uh, the boss, the executives kind of want, want this being worked on, or this is what kind of marketing need. So it tends to kind of languish there, looking sorry for itself at the bottom of the, uh, uh, of the backlog or of the worklog. And, you know, if, it was a, if there was a draft picking your pieces of work, you know, poor, poor design debt would be there with, with his, his, you know, his or her friend's technical debt, you know, not being picked until the right right towards the end and as I said I think there are there are there are at least two tactics there are good two good tactics to avoid this happening um, and actually some of the teams employ both of these tactics at Redgate so the first of these is to have um, dedicated debt sprints so these are sprints that are dedicated to addressing debt you know whether it's design debt or technical debt um, in, as part of a dedicated sprint so for example, maybe before releasing a new feature or a new product, there might be a sprint just to go through, okay, so what's all the, the debt that might be introduced as part of that? Let's address that. Um, and the advantage here is that um, you can really focus that sprint on that piece of work. So have everyone, have everyone doing that. So it's kind of like, right, yep, let's, let, let's, let's all down tools and our usual feature work and let's do a debt sprint. The, a uh, second alternative tactic is to have a parallel stream to address um, some of this. So you might have an ongoing kind of stream releasing um, typically new features, but it doesn't have to be. Um, and then um, alongside that, a smaller stream where you're addressing an ongoing stream where you're addressing some of this debt. So the advantage here is that, um, you know, you're, you're able to do that work you know, that's that's more ongoing rather than a debt sprint but it does mean that you're having to balance the two and what will often happen is that the feature work will kind of push out this deck work debt work stream so i think that um you know for some teams having more dedicated debt sprints works better for other teams having more of a debt work stream i think i'd probably um err towards more the debt stream you know, the dedicated sprint than, than this parallel sprint, but it, it can vary, you know, different organizations, different teams are different. And it really comes down to what's gonna work best for you. Um, so, so I've looked at, you know, what design debt is, you know, why it's important, and then some tactics for dealing with that and some tactics that are utilized certainly within some of the teams at Redgate where, where I work. And let's, let's just quickly review those. So firstly, it's important to have a strategy because whether you, you know, whether you like it or not, you know, design debt will happen. Design and te technical debt will build up. It's kind of a, um, you know, it's inevitable really. We're taking, uh, taking an agile kind of approach. Secondly, think about creating and validating high level design. So whether that's using, you know, things like story mapping, creating a story map or using um, storyboards or low fidelity prototypes. So, you know, it's not about fleshing out all of those details up front, but about fleshing out enough to be able to um, avoid a lot of that complexity and that debt building up too much. Um, and some to, to validate that so that, again, you're not um, constantly you know releasing something having to change it releasing something having to change it um, because again that's a that that's a, a very you know that's that's where debt often kind of builds up 
Number three is user design system. And I, you know, I think it's really important to, to have a design system in place early on. So it doesn't have to be, you know, fully fleshed out design system, but you know, really if you're, if you're going ahead without a design system and thinking that's all right, we can, we can put one, one in later, you know, that's a very hard thing to do. It's a very costly thing to do and it generally just doesn't happen. You know, a design system, it gives you, uh, gives you some of that consistency and it gives you, you know, it should help um, avoid a lot of that debt building up in the first place. Certainly, you know, if it covers a lot of those scenarios and if it provides teams with enough guidance, they can use it consistently. Uh, number four is level up the team. So think about um, how can you collectively improve the design know-how, you know, within a product team. You know, whether that's through workshops, whether that's through training, whether that's through carrying out things like UX reviews as a team. Because the more the team knows about design, the less design debt a team will unwittingly uh, release and the more, uh, um, you know, the more awareness and hopefully buy-in a team will have to addressing design debt. Number five is to catch design debt at review. So if you're... Um, you know, before something is being released, maybe it's part of acceptance criteria or something like that, you know, think about, well, you know, really we should have a step here that makes sure that everything gets reviewed. It gets reviewed against our, our guidelines, maybe it gets reviewed against our, our design system. We're making sure that we're not unwittingly releasing debt. We're not unwittingly releasing usability issues that really we should be addressing. Number six is to keep a record of design debt. So go, you know, remember our guy, guy Pierce from Memento, you know, if we're discovering something, not making a record of it, we're going to forget that, you know, and then that's going to happen. We're not going to be able to know, well, what, what is the debt that, that exists that we need to address? You know, and even if, even if it's going to take a little while to be able to address some of that debt, at least having that, that record and we can start to prioritize that, we can start to think about, well, how are we going to tackle this? You know, how much is there in the first place? Uh, number seven is focus on key user tasks. So, you know, don't just think about that low hanging fruit, think about, well, what are the really key journeys? What's the most damaging debt? And doing things like a, a UX review or user testing against those key journeys is a really good way to, to highlight some of that. So you can focus on, well, what, what's going to give us the, you know, what is going to be most damaging? What, where are we going to get that almost biggest ROI from dealing with design debt? And then factor, finally, factor tackling design debt into your planning, you know, whether that's having dedicated design sprints or having like a parallel work stream um, to deal with the, the design debt. You know, it's really important to think about, well, how are we going to tackle this as an ongoing thing? Because it will happen. You know, you will build up debt and, you know, you need to have a plan to be able to tackle it. So let Sarah Winchester's mystery house be a, you know, be a warning of what can happen when design debt gets out of control. You know, and whilst you might not end up with a bonkers house like this, you know, you'll certainly end up with something that's equally as disorientating and confusing for your users. So thank you very much.